keep open your Bibles to that section because we're going to be looking this morning at two more post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Roseanne did a great job reading that encounter with Mary Magdalene. And if you're new to the Christian faith, I want to tell some of the Easter story to set up these appearances because Jesus' ministry was about three years long, his public ministry with his disciples, with his apostles. And he taught about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But he also got into a lot of trouble disrupting the political and religious powers, so to speak. And he healed many people. He healed the blind and the lame and the leper. He exercised people from demons. He raised the dead. He walked on water. Many miraculous signs that Jesus did. And he taught about the kingdom of God to us But many people tried to stop Jesus. And I've entitled today's sermon, Raised and Unstoppable, or Risen and Unstoppable, because Jesus will not be stopped. He will not be stopped. Death will not hold him down. The cross will not stop the ministry of Jesus or the mission of Jesus, as we will see in our text this morning. Now, even the disciples, if you say, well, all the religious leaders tried to stop him, mm mm-mm. Even Peter, when he heard about Jesus' mission to set his eyes to Jerusalem and die for the sins of the world, he said, that'll never happen, Lord. He wanted to stop the mission of Jesus. And Jesus even had to say to his disciples and Peter, get behind me, Satan. Satan himself tempted Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus so that he was ultimately handed over to the officials to be nailed to the cross. But what the devil did not know and what everybody did not know is that Jesus was fulfilling the perfect plan of God. Friday, he was sealed into a tomb, and to stop the ministry and the mission and the message of Jesus, they not only put guards in front of the tomb, they put a big stone and they sealed that stone. They did everything they could to make sure that they stopped Jesus Christ. But as you know, early Sunday morning when the sun was just beginning to dawn, angels from heaven were deployed and Jesus began to breathe again in the same body that was crucified and they rolled back the stones. He literally walked out of the grave claws. You'll see them there earlier in John chapter 20 where the grave claws are folded there neatly and Jesus comes out of the tomb with all power in his hand, resurrection power, which he now gives to the entire world, to all those who trust in him. And here in John 20, Mary Magdalene, she's a hero of mine. She is like the apostle to the apostles because they are all hiding. And as we'll see in our text this morning, they have some doors that are locked out of fear. Maybe you come to church this morning with some of your own doors Locked, figuratively speaking, trying to shut out God from your life, maybe trying to keep a safe distance from other people. So I want to look at these locked doors in John chapter 20 and how not only death, but doors themselves cannot keep out the risen Jesus from your life. So we're reading Risen and Unstoppable, and just to get us started, I'm going to read verses 19 and 20 pray for us, and then we're going to go to the end of the chapter looking at these resurrection appearances of Jesus where he will not be stopped. So follow along where we left off in verse 19. Well, on the evening of that day, which day? That's the Sunday, the day that Jesus appeared before Mary Magdalene, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, risen and unstoppable. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. We thank you, Jesus, that you are here and that your resurrection power is available to all those who would trust in you. And just as 2,000 years ago, doors could not stop you. Nothing can stop you, Jesus. Locked doors can't stop you. The grave can't stop you. Stones can't stop you. Guards can't stop you. Nothing can stop you. And so, God, I pray if there are any here this morning with their walls up and their doors locked, that, Jesus, you would walk through those doors, expel fear, and grant peace, just as you did in those early days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Locked doors are pretty effective. Would you agree? Have you ever locked yourself out of your own house? I've done it multiple times. When we first moved to Florida, Fort Lauderdale, a couple years ago, many years ago now, 10 years ago, I guess, um, we got a rental house in Coral Springs, and I don't know how I did I guess I locked the handle, you know, that's sort of the old strategy, you lock the handle and pull the door shut, and you realize like, oh, stink, I just locked myself out of my own house. And so I fortunately had my cell phone on me, called a locksmith, and about $150, and two hours later, we were good to go. Locked doors, they work. They work today, they worked thousands of years ago. You know, my wife shared a story with me the other day about her and my, my son Isaac. He's my youngest son. He's seven now, but he must have been about four when they locked themselves out of the garage. I don't know why. We moved back up here, and they, they had not only a padlock on the garage door, but also on the handle. And so once again, locked the handle, pulled the door, and you even have the code so you can get into the garage, but the handle was locked, and their phone was in the house. That's right. And so my little son Isaac, he is panicking. He is running around like, ah, I don't know what to do. We're locked out of our own house. My wife is keeping him going, Isaac, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. But she's literally thinking, I can't even call the locksmith now. And so they're in the garage, and she gets this idea. If you see our house, we live on this really big hill. And so the backyard, there's a balcony and the sliding door. And she has the thought, maybe I let the sliding door open. So she grabs one of these big ladders and puts it, now, not a little bit, I mean like half the size of this pillar, if you will, leans it up there, climbs up, and prays the Lord. The slider door was open. She got in, unlocked the door, and we took the lock off of the handle <laughs> after that. <laughs> Why do we need two locks? We don't need two locks. Locks work. But we see in these two post-resurrection appearances, this one with the disciples and a locked door, and soon in a moment with Thomas as well, these two appearances, and we look at them over and over again. One of the things I want to draw your eyes to is these, these doors. And as I said earlier, the stone, the death of Jesus, the guards of Jesus, the doors, all of these things are trying to shut out Jesus, but Jesus will never be shut out. And he will never be shut out. Jesus can walk through stones, through doors, through grave clothes. None of that will stop Jesus Christ from entering into your life and fulfilling his purpose for you. Jesus can walk through any door. What stops us? Shoot, I bent over to put a leash on my dog the other day, and I've been hobbling for the last three weeks. I just twinged something. Jesus was just nailed to a cross. He was whipped, and now he is marching triumphantly through doors, all right? Nothing, nothing, nothing can stop Jesus from fulfilling the purposes he has for the world and for your life. And there's three ways I want to look at these post-resurrection Easter appearances. This first one's on Easter Sunday, and then Thomas, and then the purpose of the book will wrap up at the end. The first is death and doors. They can't stop Jesus. So this is your main idea if you're taking notes. Death and doors can't stop Jesus. His first, his sin-forgiving mission. Death and doors cannot stop Jesus' sin-forgiving mission. Verses 21 to the 23 here. After he walks through those locked doors, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Death and doors will not stop Jesus' sin-forgiving mission. Jesus walks through that locked door. Now, this is Sunday night. Mary Magdalene, I am sure, has already gone to them and said, Bros, you guys get out. Jesus is alive. I saw him. The women are the heroes at the end of the Gospels. Did you know that? Jesus picked up a bunch, of, a bunch of men, and they all fled. And it's the women who provided for Jesus out of their means. They were the money bags. Like they were providing for Jesus, including Mary Magdalene, by the way. They were the ones by the foot of the cross watching Jesus when the disciples had fled. Thank you, sisters. And they're the ones going to the tomb. They're going to the tomb at great cost and risk for their lives. Peter's by the fire. There's a woman, remember this? 
where Jesus is being handed over, the rooster's about to crow, there's a servant girl, and Jesus is denying, or excuse me, Peter's denying Jesus before the servant girl. Mary Magdalene shows up, she is all in, and she encounters Jesus, runs back, and what do the disciples do? They lock the doors. They say she's crazy. That that could not have happened. They were not expecting this. They were not creating a story. Hey, I have a way we can really spin this and get a great following. One day we'll have big statues and paintings of us. No, they weren't doing any of that. They were fearful for their lives, and they had that door locked tight and and shut. But Jesus walks right through that door, speaks peace into their fearful moment. And then he says this. As the Father has sent me, so now I send you. And he gives them an impartation of the Holy Spirit, God's personal power and presence into their lives. He literally breathes upon them God's Spirit, and they receive them. And then he says, go, as you, I have been sent, now you go with this message of forgiveness. You take this to the world, and when you declare that their sins are forgiven in my name, their sins are canceled. Their sins are gone. I've been sent to forgive the sins of the world. Now I am sending you with this saving message and the power of the Holy Spirit. And you cannot keep that locked up in this room. You must go. Now, I have a question for you. Why did Jesus walk through that door? I'll tell you why he didn't walk through that door. I don't believe he walked through that door to forgive their sins. Their sins were already forgiven. They were already saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, they flaked out, but they were legitimate disciples except for Judas. They believed in him. He walked through that door to forgive your sins. And mine. Because what Jesus started here was a chain reaction where he imparted the Holy Spirit and this message to them to be handed off from generation to generation to generation so that here we are over 2,000 years later, right? 2,000 years later, we are here in Havertown, Pennsylvania, in the United States of America, preaching this message of the risen Jesus because God wants to impart his spirit to you so that as the Father sent him, he would now send you, but you first before you go with that message, must receive the forgiveness of your sins to have that chain reaction occur. He walked through that door to save you and to forgive you. I remember as a teenager, before I came to Christ, those who go to Manoa regularly know my story. Here's the abbreviated version. I was in a rock band with my twin brother, Matt. He was the guy that looks like me playing the bass this morning. (laughs) We were in a band called Molly Coddle which means a person of weak character who seeks to be pampered and protected. (laughs) We just thought it sounded cool. Kind of thesaurus dictionary thing, yeah. Kind of prophetic, though. (laughs) And my whole high school career was sent promoting myself, recording CDs, back when we had CDs. You all remember those things? Um, T-shirts and, you know, stickers and posters. My backpack was full of this stuff, and I went to church on Sunday, but I even remember Easter, I didn't get it. I I, I mean, I was a a once-a-week Christian at best, and Easter, I thought, what's the big deal with Jesus being risen from the dead? I, I really had that thought. Why does that make any difference in my life? So that's where I was spiritually, theologically at that time in my life. But our band played at this church. Our music was ungodly. It was not a Christian band, but we played there because our name would get put on the radio, and we covered Christian music, so they let us slip in the back door. And this girl here shared the gospel with my brother and ultimately ricocheted back to me. And she said, she heard our music and she said, I don't get it. You say you're a Christian, but your music's all this cuss words, all this darkness, all of this evil. And we said, well, I don't think God would want us to give that up. I don't think he cares about this stuff. She said this, she said, Jesus gave up everything for you on the cross. He died for these very sins that you are singing about and celebrating. And now he calls you to repent. Pick up your cross and follow him. And the Holy Spirit used her words sharing Christ with us to bring about conviction and a newness of life and repentance into our lives. And here's where the story is going. I remember a few weeks afterwards, I had my door shut. 
And I was in my bedroom meditating on God's Word and praying and as a kid. I mean, how many teenagers are doing that, right? Like, there was a new thing that God was doing in my life. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus breathed upon me, gave me a fresh impartation. Maybe the first time. I don't know. It's all fuzzy back then. But I remember shaking in my room, so full of God's power and presence. For hours, I stayed awake praying to God. And that night, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, it forever changed my destiny and destination. I took my CDs out of my backpack, and I started sharing Christ with my friends at school. I put my Bible in there. I went to Drexel University and started a campus ministry. Some of you got saved in that ministry that are at this church today. It's a long time ago. My whole life changed, and I went with the message of forgiveness, and I shared that with others. And some of you here today are saved, spreading that message. My first challenge for you this Resurrection Easter Sunday is Jesus walks through these doors, yes, to save you and to forgive you and give you a mission for your life. (laughs) Easter's not all about you. I love the ham, I love the eggs, I love the family gatherings. Easter's about the whole world and God using you and walking into your life and then through your life and sending you on a great mission. And I believe that the church in America, we have too far low of a bar. If you think Christianity is coming to Christmas on Christmas and Easter, can I raise the bar for you? It is a cause worth giving your whole life for because Jesus gave his whole life for you. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and the same Holy Spirit that he breathed upon these early disciples, he wants to give to you so that your whole life would be transformed, that you would receive the forgiveness of sins and keep that chain reaction going to the ends of the earth. God has a wonderful plan for your life, a wonderful plan to go on mission. As the Father has sent him, he now sends you. Secondly, death endures. Not only can they not stop Jesus' sin-forgiving mission, they can't stop Jesus' doubt-defeating love. His doubt-defeating love, this is the appearance 24 to 28 before Thomas. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger in the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Well, eight days later, his, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, there it is again, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Death and doors can't stop Jesus' doubt-defeating love. Now, Thomas, in tradition, gets a bad rap. (laughs) You ever hear of a doubting Thomas? Right here. And you think about the apostles, we don't get a lot of their, I don't know, words from their lips. They're usually just clustered together. So every now and again, they pop out on their own. Now, Peter gets a lot of face time, but the rest of them sort of blend into the crowd. But here, Thomas pops out, and he's forever branded as the doubter. But Thomas really was a courageous disciple. I mean, earlier when Jesus set his sights back to Jerusalem to go to raise Lazarus, Thomas was the one that said, let us go too that we may die with him. I mean, they were, he knew that death awaited Jesus. He's like, well, if Jesus is going to die, we might as well all go and die with him. I mean, he was ready to die with Jesus at that moment. And before Jesus went back to the Father, to heaven, he told us that he was going to prepare a place for us. And Thomas wanted to make sure he knew precisely how to get there. He says, Lord, we don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, Thomas, and the truth and the life. Thomas did not want to miss his chance to follow Jesus wherever he goes, even to the Father's house. So Thomas is a faithful disciple. But something about the death of Jesus Christ, when he saw his Savior pierced, when he saw all those nails hammered through his wrists, when he saw that 
spear pierced his side into his heart, and water and blood flowed from his side. When he saw Jesus die, his faith died too. This is not what Thomas expected. This is not how he expected Jesus to go and prepare a place for him. And though Thomas was willing to die in that moment, something changed in his heart and his mind. He said, none of this makes any sense anymore. None of you make any sense anymore. And they said, he walked through a locked door, Thomas. He showed us his hands in the side. You wonder, why is he asking for his hand in the side? Look earlier. Jesus just did that for them. He said, I think y'all are nuts. But I'm not going to believe it unless I see it for myself, unless I place my hand into his side and into the holes in his wrists. I will not believe it. And then once again, we're told the door was locked. But I'm so glad that Jesus is omniscient, that though he is still bodily raised from the dead, he hears your thoughts. He hears what you speak in private. He hears and knows it all. And Thomas gets his own special appearance. The other disciples are there, but once again, death will not stop Jesus from his doubt-defeating love, nor will that door. He walks right through that door, and he says, I think you have a request, Thomas, and I am here to fulfill it. Here's my hands, Thomas. Feel them. Here is my side, Thomas. Place your hand into my side. Do not doubt anymore, but believe. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, there's a bit of a Thomas in each one of us. You say, well, what really threw Thomas into a tailspin? Was it that he didn't believe in the existence of God anymore, that he didn't see God's fingerprints in the design of the Creator in all of his creation? I don't think it was that. It's not like, ah, the Trinity's too confusing. I'm done with this, you know. It was his own personal experiences. It was his suffering in life. It was his suffering from religious people who claimed to be speaking for God. Think about that. He saw the most spiritual religious people doing some of the most wicked things, and he couldn't handle it. His brain couldn't fit it. He saw all the evil. He saw all the suffering. He saw the death, and he experienced the loss of a loved one. He saw betrayal. He saw one of his closest friends that he never thought would sell him or Jesus out, turn his back for some money. And he said, I'm done. I don't believe it anymore. I don't believe this, and I don't believe you all. I am done. And maybe you're here this morning coming because someone dragged you to church because it's Easter, right? And I want you to evaluate your resistance to God and your resistance to Jesus. Is it really the, I don't believe God could make everything and speak it into existence? For a lot of people, I think it's far more personal. Somebody betrayed me that was religious. I'm hurting, and if the Bible says God is good, then why am I hurting so much? Somebody died and they shouldn't have died, and they didn't deserve to die. At our heart of hearts, we look at this broken world. We say, if it's so broken and so messed up, then how could God and Christ be real? And I don't have pat answers for you this Easter Sunday morning, but I do have the answer that Jesus gave to Thomas which is the God that we worship when he said, my Lord and my God. Jesus did not walk into that room and go, Jazam, no more pain for you, Thomas. Everything is A-OK. No, he walked into that room and he says, I get it. I suffered. I suffered at the hand of wicked people. I was betrayed and I overcame death and suffering for you. And I turned the other cheek, literally. I did it all for you. And then when you follow Jesus, you're not walking into a perfect, easy world, far from it. But you're walking into a world where death does not win. Where wickedness does not get the final say. And where the scars of Jesus Christ forever will remain in heaven. So that on that final day when we meet him face to face and he wipes away every tears, he has still got the scars there for you. To say, you are here because I suffered. And you suffered, yes, but my suffering was for you driving in the car with my wife and kids, and the song Scars by I Am They came on. Beautiful lyrics. I want to put them on the screen. 
says, I'm thankful for the scars. Because without them, I wouldn't know your heart. And I know they'll always tell of who you are, so forever, I'm thankful for the scars. I can see, I can see how you delivered me in your hands, in your feet. I found my victory, so I'm thankful for the scars. Consider that your Lord and your God forever has scars in his hands and in his side to forever remember his great love for you. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart, we sing. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. There is evil. It is real. Darkness is real. But God has taken it all on himself on the cross. And listen to this. He has ultimately defeated it through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Death will not have the final say in your life if you're in Christ. Betrayal will not be the final sting that rests over your life. Evil will not win. And fakers and frauds will be cast into the lake of fire. My biggest goal is not to worry about all the fakers and frauds out there. It's to make sure that I don't become one of them. Get your heart right with the Lord. Jesus, he'll walk through that door. Do not lock him out because of suffering that you experience. My Lord and my God, we worship a risen Jesus, and death and doors cannot stop his doubt-defeating love. Finally, death and doors can't stop Jesus' life-imparting power. His life-imparting power, verse 29 to the end of the chapter, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life, life, life in his name. Death and doors cannot stop Jesus' life-imparting power. He walked through those doors so that you could be forgiven. He walked through those doors so that he can overcome your doubt. And he rose from the dead. That stone was rolled back. All of these miraculous things that Jesus did. Not only this sign, but John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says he did many other signs. When he turned water into wine. When he walked on water. When he fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fish. When he raised the lame so they could walk. When he gave the blind their eyesight back. When he did all of these things. Why did Jesus do all of this? It was not simply a raw demonstration of God's power. No, it's very impressive. It was that you might believe. God is showing his hands here. Did you see that? He says, I'm writing these things. Why? Why have I recorded this? Why has he not only done it, but why has this been preserved in Holy Scripture throughout all of time so that you may know with certainty what Jesus Christ has done? Why did all of these signs happen? So that you might believe, and by believing, you might have life in his name. Jesus rose from the dead to give you life. He came back to life so that you might share in it with him forever. Because as Estee prayed earlier, the resurrection power of Jesus is something that he freely gives away to all those who come to him by faith. You can be like that teenager myself many years ago with the door locked. But when Jesus walks through that door and imparts his spirit to you, you will never be the same. He will give you life. In his name. You know, and as we start to wrap up this Easter Sunday sermon, I want to say this really clearly as well. Not only did death not stop Jesus' life imparting power, his doubt defeating in your life, his mission, unbeknownst to all of us until after the fact. His death was not only the thing, well, his death was the thing that secured it all along. It didn't stop it. 
It was the gateway through it. It was the key that unlocks it for your life. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all of your sins, to cancel out the record of debt that stood against you before God the Father. He died on the cross to free you from the accusation of the devil and the power that he would have in your life. Jesus died to pay for it all. He nailed all of your sins to the cross. And then when he rose from the dead on the third day, he now grants life and freedom and liberty and everlasting life to all those who trust in him. So the death of Jesus Christ, not only did it not stop his mission, it was the very means to fulfill it. And this Easter Sunday, as we look backwards on the cross, we celebrate the cross. Yes, it was a terrible event, the greatest human evil that's ever happened, and at the same time, the greatest mysterious salvation event for the sins of the whole world. Can I get an amen? Amen. So the last door I want to land on as I invite the band up here in the choir for our closing song of praise. The end of your Bibles in Revelation chapter 3, the risen Jesus speaks to a church. He speaks to people at the church, and he says, I'm on the outside knocking on your hearts. It's Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Maybe you've heard it before. He says, behold, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. I find it fascinating that the Jesus who will walk through any locked door knocks. The last locked door to experience the resurrection power of Jesus in your life, to experience his forgiveness in your life, is the very locked door of your heart. And Jesus gives you a promise. It's right there. It's on the screens. If you hear his voice, you open that door, he will come into you. You'll experience fellowship with him. And in the mystery of God's providence and sovereignty, for whatever reason, he says, I'm standing, I'm knocking. You need to exert your will here. You need to open your heart to me. Because the risen Jesus will still walk through that door. But he tells you to listen. In this moment, listen for his voice, not mine. Listen for the voice of Jesus. He says, I love you. Listen for the voice of Jesus that shows you his wounds that are healed for you. Listen for the voice of the Savior who says, all that come to me will hear my voice. And if you come to him, he will forgive you of all of your sins. He will grant you the gift of everlasting life. And he will give you his Holy Spirit and send you on mission for him. Let's stand. I want to give you a chance to do that through prayer right now. Please bow your heads before we close with a song of praise. If you're here this Easter Sunday, Maybe you don't go to church often, but you hear these words and you say, I believe it. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that he died for me. I believe that there is life in his name. Yes, I still have my doubts, but I believe that Jesus can overcome them. If you would open your heart to Jesus, if you would open the door to Jesus, his promise to you is he will come in to your life. This Easter Sunday, you can experience the risen power of Jesus personally. So if you'd like to do that before we close in a song, just raise your hand, slip up your hand. No one's looking but me. I just want to give you a a prayer that you could pray to open your heart to Christ. Is there any this morning? I see you. Who else? I see you. Who else? Thank you. I see you in the back. Thank you. Pray this to the Lord. If you lift up your hands, just raise your hands in a posture to receive from him now. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you are alive and that you died and rose again for me. 
And I thank you that you walked through that door of those early disciples so that this chain reaction could find me in Havertown, Pennsylvania today in a small church on the corner of Eagle and Sunny Hill that the message of your saving grace would find me. And today, Jesus, I declare, I believe, like Thomas, that you are my Lord and you are my God. Come into my life. Breathe your Holy Spirit upon me. Forgive me of all of my sins and send me on a mission for you that I may walk in the resurrection power that you provide, not only on Sundays, not only on Easter Sundays, but every day of my life unto eternity. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And now, Lord, I turn my prayers to the larger church, God, and we thank you. We thank you that we have life in your name. And Lord, I pray that you would breathe afresh upon us your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would be filled, that as you have been sent, Jesus, so we would go from this place on Easter and every day of our lives on mission for you. As you have been sent with this message to forgive us, Lord, may we go with this message of forgiveness to the very ends of the earth. May we be a people and may we be a church who walks in the light as you are in the light. That we would walk in resurrection power. And that the message of Easter would be our story every day of our lives. Be glorified. Be glorified in our lives, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.